subscribe. <laughs> uh, I hope this camera goes away. Is that... <laughs> um, I, I currently have three videos posted on my YouTube channel where I am reading academic papers. If that's interesting to you, go check it out. If not, I make no promises about the quality, so it's whatever. Um, okay, so let's, let's actually do something with the large language models. Specifically, we're going to go to Hugging Face and we're going to look up a data set. Data sets are good. We've already looked at what they look like. In this case, I'm using a data set that's relatively popular called Glue. And Glue is a collection of a bunch of natural language um, tasks. Specifically, I want to look at the MRPC task. Okay. Also, still stop me at any time if you have questions, but we're going to start actually writing some code here. So the data set looks like this. This is the first thing we want to look at. What does it look like? We have sentence one is one of our columns, sentence two is one of our columns, and then label. And label looks like it's either one or zero. And one seems to mean that it's equivalent, and zero means that it's not equivalent. So without knowing anything else about the data set, we can draw an inference about what's going on here. If you look at the, the um, actual row, we have two sentences that roughly mean the same thing, but they're said a different, slightly different way. And then the label is that they're equivalent. And then when you look at one of the non-equivalent ones, you see that these two things are talking about potentially the same thing, but they're saying different information. So they are not equivalent. So this data set is all about semantic similarity. If two things are roughly semantically equivalent, label of one. If two things are different, label of zero. This is a hard task to figure out. Given two sentences, do they mean the same thing? But we're going to try and solve it. OK? So if we were to start from scratch, I'm in a Google Colab. This is a free Google Colab. And I'm going to connect to a T4 GPU, which is free to do on Google Colab. I have not paid them any money. First thing that we want to do is start by pip installing datasets. And when we pip install datasets, it's going to go get that library so that we can actually use our dataset. Um, specifically, we can say from datasets, import load dataset, and then dataset equals load dataset of, what was it called? It's uh, glue, and we want the MRPC piece. And this is going to go ahead and download our data set. Cool. It's got all of the stuff that we want. If we look at it, it tells you right there, we have train, validation, and test splits of our data set. So we can train on the train. We can evaluate on our validation and test. And then it shows you all the features that we saw in Hugging Face. We have sentence one, sentence two, and label. Cool? So far, you're with me? Scroll up? Yeah. Yeah. I was just outputting that. And th this is how I loaded it. Yeah. I'll make these uh, notebooks available later as well. Um, but if you want to follow along, definitely go ahead and follow along. And we can, we can experiment together. Right. So we have a data set. Now we need to do something with it. And we're using an old-ish data set. Glue. So let's use an old-ish model. Specifically, let's use BERT. You've probably heard about BERT before. This is one of the original um, large language models, if you will. It's actually kind of small by today's standard. The base model is 120 million parameters. Uh, I think it says down here somewhere the sizes. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, wait, I can look at it here. BERT base, 110 million parameters. So as opposed to these larger ones, the 7 billion from um, Facebook that we will later work with, et cetera. And to use it, we want to use the transformers library. So we're going to, once again, pip install a library, transformers. Um, and I think we need the torch bindings as well. 
So we're going to pip install transformers torch. This will take just a second. Um, but we can start using it immediately. So we can, whoa, where do we go? From transformers, is this big enough? I could make the text bigger. Can you guys read it in the back? Yeah, fine. All right, from transformers, uh, we want to transformers. We want the tokenizer, um, which we've talked about before. The tokenizer is the first step in translating your data set into something that you can actually work with. We want to turn sentences and letters into numbers. Um, cool. Specifically, we want to translate our entire data set. So we can say um, our mapped data set is going to be equal to our data set dot map. And then we need to write a tokenizing function which for a given input is going to return um, the token. Oh, well, actually, we need the tokenizer. But the tokenizer of the x at sentence 1 is one of our keys. And uh, x at sentence 2. What else do we need? We need batched is true. Some of these are just keywords that you remember. And we have the we have to create our actual tokenizer, which will be an auto tokenizer on our model. All right. I think this should get us there. So what I'm saying is, go through our entire data set and apply this function to it, so that we can tokenize all of the sentences within it. Yeah. Question. Uh, did you No, that was actually uh, by default that it, it comes that way. It's got train validation and test. Okay, like, what do you possibly mean, like, have that load and uh, like, load the load data set function? Yeah, so this is, we're, we're just calling the load data set here. Nice. Yep. Uh, did we actually get an error here saying we had already? This might give us an issue where we have to restart. But if we have to restart, that's not a big deal. Um, auto tokenizer and hit states to uh, da, 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 da. Uh, what what's this keyword like model it's not it's not model we we need to give it like the name of our thing oh 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 no 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 here we go all right let's make sure that that works do 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 tokenizer this is supposed to have a parenthesis sometimes coding is hard sometimes you rely on copilot too much all right so what we've done we have created our tokenizer for bert base this was uploaded to hugging face at some point in time and then we mapped our data set Across our data set, we tokenized all of our sentences. And along the way, we batched them, which is kind of nice, kind of convenient. There's one step here that's kind of funky um, that we can mostly just ignore, uh, but you need to actually do it. From transformers, we're going to import the uh, data collator uh, with padding. And we're going to create our data collator equals a data later with padding of tokenizer equals tokenizer. And what this is going to allow us to do is to pad all of our input to be the same length. We don't need to talk too much about that. It's just going to magically do what it does. And so long as you include it, you're going to be fine. OK, cool. Now we get to the actual model from transformers. Import a sequence model, no, auto model, auto model for sequence classification. Yep. Model is equal to auto model for sequence. It's so slow to auto complete these things. 
Okay, so here what we're saying is go download the model for BERT base and turn it into something that I can use. Again, this is just abstractions provided by the transformer library. We don't need to know all of the inner workings of BERT to be able to download the model, tokenize text, and use it. Okay? So we should be able to run that, and it's going to download a couple of things for us. Do, 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 do. We're almost there. We see a warning here that says some weights might not have been initialized. You might want to train this model. And indeed, we will. So uh, from transformers, everything is just directly from transformers. We want to import training arguments. Uh, train args is equal to training arguments. It should autocomplete for me, please. Yes, OK, good. Uh, we need to provide a name. We can just say test run one. And I think that's all that we actually need to give it. And now, actually, we're ready to train. So trainer. We create a trainer. And basically, we just pass it everything that we've passed it at this point. So we say the model is equal to the model. We say the training arguments. What do they call it? Is it training underscore arguments? Some of these things I always look up. So if, if you feel like, where am I pulling these from, it's all just like trying to remember. So we have args is training arguments, train data set. Args equals train args. Training data set equals um, mapped data set at training or train. Uh, what else do we have? Validation data set, probably. Come on. We have eval data set. We have tokenizer. Can I get? Golly. All right, I ran this uh, in my other notebook to test that everything works, so I'm just going to go copy the arguments and we can talk about them. Because it's kind of slow to do it that way. All right, so what do we pass in? We have the model, we have our train args, uh, we want our mapped data set for the training data set the map data set for our validation data set. We have our data collator, and we have our tokenizer. All right. At this point, I believe us to be ready to say trainer.train. And this is the one magical statement that if we've done everything else right, it's not going to work. Ah, because of that import error from the very start. So if you give me just 30 seconds, we can restart and run all. That This import error just happened because we imported our thing too quickly, uh, which actually means we're going to have that same, same issue a second time. OK. So we're restarting from the top. We're going to install data sets and transformers. We're going to load in our data set. We can look at what comes out. This is actually unnecessary and might cause issues that it was there. We're going to set up our tokenizer just like we did before, our data collator just like we did before, our model just like we had, until we finally get to the train. Any questions at this point? These are all the kind of pipelined steps that get you to the point where you can train a model. You have your own data set. You have a model. 
run train. All right, if we're lucky, this will actually start training. Look at it go. Now you kind of sit and wait. This is 110 million parameters. We're working on a 12 gigabyte um, or 15 gigs of RAM, uh, on, of GPU RAM on the Google Colab. It's only using 3.5 gigs. So we could try and optimize this and increase our batch size so things go faster if we wanted. But the 110 million parameters, not too bad to work with. We haven't done any optimization. We haven't really done anything fancy at all. And we're actually training. <coughs> so you just sit and wait two minutes. We're coming up on finishing our first epoch. And we'll get some output. But I was anticipating that this would be kind of slow and that you guys might not have questions. So I asked GPT-4 to write me some jokes. <laughs> so. Why don't computers ever get cold? They have windows. I don't, I don't get it. That doesn't, like, don't windows, I don't know, whatever. Why is it going to be cold at work? <laughs> because it left its window open. <laughs> Why don't computers play tennis? They try to surf the net. You know, like the, the net in the middle. I don't, I don't know. It seems like a bad joke. Anyway, um, we, we finished 500 steps, and we got a training loss, which tells you actually very little. But look at that. It, it, you know, it did 500 train steps. Cool. And soon we're going to do 1,000 and get a new training loss. And if you're lucky, it will be lower than the first one, <laughs> if you've done everything right. But this is actually only going to tell us our training status. And we do want more information than this. So I'm going to add a little bit more code here. Um, we can predict across our mapped data set uh, on the test segment. And this is going to give us a set of predictions. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Train loss is much lower, 0.32 instead of 0.57. So it seems like our model is learning the train data. But we want to check that it's also learning validation data, or, or doing better on validation data, without having to actually learn it. Um, so we can get our predictions. And our predictions are going to return two things. It's going to return uh, logits, which are the uh, individual probabilities of the possible outputs. Oh, you know what I didn't do? I think we have to specify here that n labels is 2. But it's working without that. So I wonder what its default is. I guess it's just the, the default classification size. Um, but we only use two labels, right? We only use 0 and 1. So we could have specified here that n labels is 2. We don't have to. It'll just choose to never predict on the other, you know, however many labels it's it could output. All right. So our logits are the probabilities across all of our possible um, classes, our categories, and then we have our uh, labels. And these are the um, ground truth answers. We can rework this. So we could say um, that the predictions themselves are numpy.argmax of our logits across the um, negative 1 axis. So basically, if I have a list of all of the possible outputs, it's 70% chance of 1, 30% chance of 0. Go get the maximum of those, which in this case would be the 1. So give me the 1 back. Uh, we will need to actually import numpy here to use that. Other than this, um, 
or is this done and we can just run it? it looks like it finished so can we run this? no do, 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 do. Uh, is it not predict? what's it called? Um, what do you have for me? this really should have a predict Yeah, we could just evaluate it, and that, that might be good enough. Just do the forward pass, but I don't think it's going to give us the right thing. I, I think it's dot generate. Dot generate? I don't... Yeah, this isn't going to give us what we want, because um, we're, we're doing classification, not uh, language modeling. So I, I wonder if I actually did need to do this n labels is two, otherwise it's, um, and it's num labels, it's not n labels. Remembering your code. Uh, so now, without training it, we should still be able to run this, uh, but it should be predict. No, it doesn't have predict. What am I missing? What is it, what is it called? Oh, it's the trainer that predicts. It's not the model. It's not the model that predicts. Well, now we've reset our model, so we're going to have to retrain. Oh, well, there's going to be a lot of that today. Hopefully. Yeah? How come it's trainer don't predict here? That's a great question. Why is it trainer dot predict here? Also, why didn't it give me uh, two things? Um, so trainer.predict, why is it trainer.predict? Because we have configured it in a bunch of different ways. So the model itself is just the language model is the way to think about it. The trainer is also the data collator, the tokenizer, and all those other pieces of the pipeline. Um, so that's why we do trainer.predict, not just model.predict. OK, if we look at what preds is, uh, preds. Prediction output, yeah, it should have both. Whatever, it didn't want to give them to me. Can I do? Um, yeah, there we go. So if we look at X, this is our distribution across our two labels. So for example, this first one has a much higher probability of being 1 and a much lower probability of being 0. And then if we look at the label, indeed it is supposed to be a 1. Cool, so these are our predictions. We have our logits, we have our labels, and then we can ignore z. Okay, and if we look at predictions, so now we have actual predictions, 0 or 1, from our input. And we want to compare those against the um, actual labels to evaluate. There's a nice library for this called evaluate. Um, and we can then say import evaluate and metric equals evaluate of blue MRPC uh, and then metric dot is it score? I guess we'll just start here and try and get the help. Um, what is it? Metrics.compute. Metric.compute. Uh, 
Oh, what did I call it? How much you want to bet it's metric? No, it's dot load, it's dot load. Okay, so we're going to be able to evaluate on MRPC, and we can evaluate and get our accuracy is 83.7%, and our F1 score is 88.29. Well, it's 0.88. So this is the quality of our output. As we train, it should get better. And we can actually do that if we cheat and copy some code in because I want to speed us up just a little bit. Um, evaluation strategy. Uh, no, no, this is uh, epoch. Let's do that. And then. What did I miss? Metrics. Coding is an iterative process, as you guys know. Okay, now when we're training, we're going to actually get training loss and validation loss. And once we actually hit the epoch, we will also get those metrics of um, accuracy and F1 score. Okay, so now we're back to waiting. Yeah, question. Yeah, so what are metrics? Um, what, what are these ones specifically? So we have a classification task where we're trying to predict zero or one. Your accuracy is how many times were you correct, right? That's just a, here's how many you got right, here's how many you got wrong, correct out of total, that's your accuracy. Uh, F1 score is a measurement of your true positive, or it's, it's effectively, trying to describe your false positive and false negative trade-off. Um, so there's a wonderful graphic for uh, F1 score <laughs> that I, I really like from Wikipedia, where in order to compute your F1, you want to know how many true positives did you have, how many false positives did you have, and then how many false negatives did you have. So your true positives, your ones that look like ones, your false positives, your zeros that look like ones, and then your ones that look like zeros <laughs> is, is how you do it. And you can compute your precision and your recall using the visual colors up above. And then your F1 score is a combination of your precision and your recall. This is kind of stats side of things rather than the learning side of things. Do we have uh, any results yet? Do, 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 do. Oh my gosh. This is why copy pasting code is dangerous. Because you call something numpy and they call it NP. Um, all right, other questions? Okay, so we're going to see some results here in a minute. But I do want to um, cover one of the interesting things that happens now. Because we are training BERT base, which is relatively small, on a specific data set to do a specific thing. And all that we have to do to change our model so that it's, for example, BERT large, is I change from being BERT base to being BERT large. And then down when I actually download it, I also, if you were a good coder and you used a single constant for your model name, you only have to change it once. But now we've updated to using the large model of BERT. 
which we can go look at here, BERT large uncased is more than three times larger. And that's all that we would have to do, and then we could restart our training, which, so here we have some results initially. And I'll show you what happens with the results if you train the same way on the large model once this one finishes. Yeah? What's like a case model? Like what's the difference between case and uncase? Yeah, it's uh, uppercase and lowercase count or they don't count. Yeah. So you have pre-processing to remove it or you don't. Yeah? Um, there's a sentence about the data set map. Here. This one. Yeah. So here we are first loading in our tokenizer so that we can convert our data set into a list of tokens. Each, each row in our data set. So we have these. This is our input. But the model can't understand what this says. So we have to tokenize it to turn it into a list of tokens. The way that we do that, or one way that we can do that, is um, by using this data set map and then basically replacing our sentence one and our sentence two with their token representations. Yeah. So here's two sentences. How do you process two first? What do you mean? Um, so first taking one sentence. Yeah, so... so um, the logic of what's going on inside of here, inside of our model, we get to abstract away and ignore. But the idea is that we take both of these token sequences, feed them through our model, and try and get an output classification. So we can, to some extent, just say it's a black box. Somehow we convert those lists of tokens into meaning to answer our question. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this might be a slightly unrelated question, but uh, how is there, is there like a certain like a similar style of metrics uh, data set uh, attached up when you're using a generative large language model? Yeah, so computing metrics with um, generative models is trickier because how do you know if it's correct or incorrect? Um, there's a term called perplexity that is typically what we chase when training. You try to minimize the perplexity of your model, which means that when predicting your next token, what's the distribution across all of the possible tokens and how does that relate to what the actual next token in your training set is? And the more weight that you assign to all the tokens that it's not, the more you're penalized. Um, but we will look at a, a fun way to do that in a different way in just a moment. So we finished training here. We did three full epochs, which means we went through our data set three times. And you can see that we kind of, uh, we, di we didn't get that much better after the first epoch. What did we start at? Oh, we didn't even get that much better based on the starting point, which actually I don't believe that. So maybe we still had the trained um, results. But I do have uh, the large model when it trained as well. And you can see it's slightly better after three epochs compared to the small model. So our loss is um, a good amount lower, actually. but. More concretely, our accuracy went up about two and a half points, and our F1 went up about two points relative to the base model. So that's kind of neat. Training worked with the large model and, and worked a bit better than with the small model. One point I wanted to make here is that you can use, and I think we can see here, what does it say? The, even the large model is not doing that much damage to our GPU. Um, on the free tier. 
what I'm going to be looking for, if you have like a project idea that's going to require some amount of let's go get some GPU hours, is if you can show me, look, I can do it on the free tier with the base model, and it runs, and we can go through all of this stuff and check that it makes sense, it's really easy to then say, let's upload this to a fancy GPU, pay for a little bit of time for it to run, because I know all that's going to change is, for example, the model size. Um, and there's no debugging on like, oh, oops, we used NP instead of NumPy, for example. So this is an extremely, um, or a very useful way to show me that you're ready to actually build something, if you can do it in CoLab. All right, we're going to move on from this, though, because this specific thing is kind of like what people were doing three or four years ago, which is a little, little bit of a snooze, so whatever, um, which is called Ludwig. Ludwig is a, a framework for working with and training AI models. So you can find it on GitHub. Low-code framework for building custom AI models like LLMs. And with Ludwig, what we can do, I'm not going to type this up as we go because it would take too long, but we can um, install, and I will actually go ahead and do all this. Let's uh, disconnect here. Cool. Reconnect here. Run my secret key. Um, we're going to start by installing Ludwig and data sets, just like we had before. This is going to take a minute to install. Then all that we really do is we set up this config, which is a YAML config where we say, I want to use Llama 2, 7 billion, from Hugging Face. I've got a couple of other features in here, such as I want to quantize it with LoRa, to f or I want to sorry, quantize it to four bits and use LoRa for training, which I'll, we, we will probably talk about those concepts later in class. But then here's the prompt template I want to use. Is sentence one semantically equivalent to sentence two? Output one if they are equivalent and uh, zero, let's say, zero if they are not. Then I have sentence one and sentence two and I ask for the response. So I'm telling Ludwig what the input is going to look like. My output is going to be text with at most four tokens because it should really just be outputting zero and one. I want to train with a batch size of two for one epoch. And I should just be able to run all this, right? Yep, that's all finished. I'm going to go ahead and download that same data set that we had. So I'm loading glue MRPC. I'm saving it to CSV files so that Ludwig can load it. Great. And then we're going to train. And all that we're doing in train is we're importing the Ludwig model. We then configure it with our config that we just created. And we pass in what our train validation and test sets are. and we should shortly get some output. There you go. Cool, 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 cool. So, okay, it's, it's reading the config, it's printing some stuff out, we can ignore most of this. You can see that we are actually on the GPU, which is always a good thing to check prints out some information about the config, um, pre-processing, um, loading Hugging Face Llama 2. Here it tells us about our data set. And now it's downloading our model. One of the big advantages of using Colab is that this thing is 13 gigabytes, which isn't that big, but I don't really want to put 13 gigs on my computer. But more importantly, the uh, download speed on the Colab servers is way better than the download speed through network uh, through the campus network. So, 150 megs a second. That's 
way faster than here or at my home network, so this is great. This will take another minute to go. Any questions on Ludwig at this point? Yeah. Nope. Okay. Langchain builds on top of large language models. Ludwig helps train your large language models. Yeah. They tackle the problem from two, two different sides. But we'll cover that in hopefully five minutes after this finishes. We'll have a little bit of time to do that too. Dun, 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 dun. It's going to load these in. We can take a look at the memory this time. So right now, it hasn't loaded our models. We're at under a gig. And it's going to start loading in the actual model. We can go back to those jokes, see if any of them are good. Why was the computer a good <coughs> musician? Anybody have an idea? Keys. Because it had the right algorithms. <laughs> what do you call a neural net that tells jokes? Chat GPT. Chat GPT, yeah, I don't know. A punning model? Is that like a. Oh, oops. Uh, that seems kind of bad. Um, why did the programmer go broke? <laughs> <laughs> the GPU. It ran out of cash, I think. Oh, Used up all no. its cash. <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. Are we are we done here? Are we done loading this? We're up to six gigs in our. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. So we made it through train through the uh, loading stage. We're now into training, and it shows us an, a, a weird line here that says trainable params, and then it's got this big number, and then it says all params, and it's got this even bigger number. And if you look at what this big number is, that's approximately 7 billion. You would round that up to 7 billion, which is not a coincidence. That's how many parameters are in the model. This is llama 7b. This piece here is roughly 4 million, and this represents what we are going to train within the llama model. And that goes back to our config where we said that we wanted to use the LoRa adapter up here. Da, da, da. We will cover adapters later. But the basic idea is that we only want to train a little bit of our model. That way we can actually train it so that it's faster and more, um, more efficient. And you'll see here we are actually training our model. So I am training. Llama 7b on a Google Colab for free on my data right now. You guys can all do this. Yeah. Um, have you noticed any, like, uh, I had a friend looking for this. Has there been any, like, uh, noticeable performance uh, increases in what uses Laura versus when using, uh, like, more training only? Um, training performance degradation with Laura. It's not going to be as good as if you could fully train your model, um, but you can actually train. It's the difference between being able to train and not being able to train. Yeah. And we're going to use like fake, like the quantization four bits, right? Yes. Also, this needs to be a four bit model, um, which means you can only do it with models that have been quantized down to four bits. So, and you can see we are starting to push our limits here on the free tier. We're up to 11 gigs. Okay, but this is actually, you know, th this is how we would go about training models if we wanted to train models. Uh, the last piece here that I wanted to do before the end of lecture, which is what time? Four minutes from now? Ooh, all right, how fast can Copilot help me? Um, <laughs> if we go to create a new folder that we can call whatever we want. Oh, my God. Bad start. Um, uh, 
So we will um, create a main.py. We're going to uh, set. We're going to do all the same things here. And we're really starting from scratch. I want to show you that. Um, what are we working with? Glue. Let's see. Uh, and then from slim import chat and load template and uh, format is what we're going to need. All right, so we're going to um, set up a little bit where we're just importing two libraries and downloading them from pip. I can zoom in a little bit so you can see what's going on. Uh, and then what we might do is um, create a new template. Uh, no, we won't start there. We're going to chat with the model. And if you've worked with these uh, models at all, you'll have seen something like this where you say, what's the system message? That's what you want to start with. Um, and then after the system message, you might have a user message. Uh, <laughs> I like to eat apples, for example. Um, we're going to set this to be the system message, uh, and we will figure what out, figure that one out in a second. Um, this I'm just going to copy from Ludwig, which might have finished, but that doesn't matter too much. All right, what did we say? So, actually, we don't even need to give anything there. So I want to still solve this same exact problem. So I'm going to tell it the instruction is, is sentence one semantically equivalent to sentence two? Output one if they're equivalent, and zero if they're not. Then my user message is going to be sentence one is sentence one, sentence two is sentence two. And so then I can say user message dot uh, uh, well, I can format, and some of these things are just nice to haves that I've created for myself. Dataset at train at zero at sentence one, and uh, that's sentence one is equal to this thing, sentence two is equal to the same thing. Thank you, copilot. Um, and we can print out that result. And if we uh, run our main and nothing has gone wrong, which, you know, sometimes it happens. It's going to first download our data set, of course, as it always does. Then we are going to hit chat GPT with our message. Let's see what happens. Ah. Did I miss something? Content. This is. Does anybody see my bug? I am formatting it here. Um, oh, it's content, not context. That makes way more sense. And then did I forget a comma? No, I didn't. There you go. So response is one. So we got out. Uh, da, da, da. Our answer to our question where I passed in 
sentence one and sentence two as possible um, inputs was one. And so I could say the result is equal to that. And then I could say if result is equal to the string of our data set at train at label print correct, else print incorrect. Thank you, copilot. And since everything's cached, it's much faster now to say correct. We got number one correct. And then what I could say is for i in range 10, do all of these things and replace, uh, like this is kind of the jank way to do it, but you could theoretically iterate through your data set like this. Um, and I think I've done everything properly there. And we'll see a lot of logs initially. But if we run it a second time, we will only see the meaningful output, which is that we got a couple of them correct and some of them incorrect as we were going. So in this way, we are no longer training the model ourselves. This is using chat uh, GPT 3.5. And we could, if we wanted to, just give it a model equals, um, or is it engine? Engine equals GPT 4. And we would then be talking to GPT 4, and we could compare those results. Or we could change things like, here we say, think step by step, and then see how that does. All of the time, we're tracking these things to compare our eval results. And in the end, we get something interesting that we can um, do science on. So that was three ways of solving a problem using very different techniques. Um, and it took a little bit more than 50 minutes. I apologize. If you have questions, meet me in my office. Last time, a student was mad because I wasn't there when I said I would be there. So I'm headed up to the office.